uh, prayer meeting. I want to add on one more thing about prayer meeting. Uh, prayer meeting is important because that's the, that's the, uh, that's the weapon we have uh, that uh, will slay the enemy, will slay Goliath. It's not going to be by might nor by power, but it's by prayer. And learning how to pray is going to be the most important thing you and I need to do in the days ahead of us because things are not going to become any better. I will need to pray, not just only for the giants to be slain, but for ourselves, for our family, for our people, for protection, for the grace of God, for all we need. So if you can join us, join us on Zoom. Uh, we are still doing it on Zoom because we believe that we could get more people from prayer meeting on Zoom. And it, uh, and it is very innovative. Zoom is actually very in, uh, good. We can do corporate prayer together. Then we can go into breakup rooms where uh, small little groups can pray for one another. So please do remember prayer meeting on Wednesday at 8 p.m. I'll send the invitation out usually to the members at Salt Shakers Chat uh, and also to the our. Some of you are not in the members chat. In, uh, but uh, because you're not a member of the church but you're visiting and if you would like us to send that to you I would ask those who are in uh, that you're part of a cell to send it to you right? okay so that you can join us uh, together so praise the Lord everything is going fine for all of us we need to thank God no? so let's get on to the word of God let me have a word of prayer with you first huh? Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, your presence is here with us. Once again, we want to just honor you, and we want to ask you to bless the word as we preach and we share the word of God together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, what we did the last time was to get one of the lights off. Uh, uh, Jenny, do you know which one? So that we can see the slides, huh? And maybe the, uh, this main one, this, uh, the roll of lights. Ah, that's better. Uh, we're not going through the same message as last Sunday, yeah? Uh, notice here, today is a prayer and a song. Last week was a stone and a sling. And by the way, did you know what is this thing all about? I only just discovered the, the other day when I was looking at it again. Take the slide, this is a cup of coffee. All right? It's a cup of coffee. So we face the giant with a prayer and a song and a cup of coffee. All right, praise the Lord. Nah? Okay. Last week we said this, but this week we said it slightly differently. I'm not getting very uh, the world around. What happened with the COVID-19, uh, at least for Malaysia, while it was going through, while it was going through, there was a background change. There was a, uh, of gov uh, I mean, there was a change of government, and uh, they could hide under the MCO and not have to prove their numbers. So I want to suggest. We're facing a failed state. We see throughout the world as best as they can. So hold on just a second. Huh? Is it change we have uh, what, did, what do they call that in TV so, whoever is watching this this is how do we going off and on
Okay. We're good, all right. Okay. Well, all technical things, we always have little glitches here and there. For all the technical at the back there, and for the things that are, they are doing to try to make this work well. Eh? So let's sit back and enjoy and relax. Right? So I want, to f I want to talk about another giant. And this is not just something outside of us. This is also going to affect us. When there is a failed state, what will happen with the citizens? What will happen with the people? Are then we're going to face increasingly difficult times. Okay? lawlessness, breakdown of systems, and things are not working anymore. Let me just define to you what is a failed state, first of all. Eh? It's a political body that has degenerated, disintegrated to a point where basic conditions and responsibilities of a sovereign government no longer function. Things are so that government is not functioning. People are having to survive on their own. A very, a very clear example, so any one of you know Somalia? That's a failed state. There's no government. They have little groups of people here fighting each other and they're all trying to dominate and there's war, people are starving, people are dying. Failed state. And I think Satan has an interest in bringing nations to a failed state. Because as more and more nations fail, as more and more lawlessness come, then it provides the backdrop for the one world government to come up. The Bible says there will come a one world government, a, a ruler, a person who seems so capable of running the world that people are going to look to him for it. So in many places, things are happening. And those of you who are from uh, 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 America may not, it's not a failed state yet, but we see a lot of chaos there today. We see political, uh, uh, such a rift between the two parties that it's almost impossible for them to come together. Uh, we see lawlessness, people going onto the streets, uh, uh, first of all, demonstrating because of what they think is a proper and a good thing, which is for, you know, for to break down racialism, but get carried over, and then now they are pulling down uh, statues and and it seems like there's a spirit of lawlessness that's breaking through. But there's another definition of a failed state that is more like what we see here in Malaysia. A failed state, if the government loses its legitimacy, even if it is performing its functions properly. We have an illegitimate government today, not properly elected. And even though things are still working, but things are not working as well as it should, it is a failed state, as far as this definition I get from the dictionary. All right? It's a failed state. It's lost its legitimacy. It has no right to be there because it was not properly elected. There was a coup d'etat, so to speak. Betrayal. And then you have a new government come that refuses to test its popularity popularity and keep pushing parliament sitting because they know that if they call a parliament they have to call a parliament sitting if they call the parliament sitting then there will be a test on whether they have the numbers or not and they refuse to do that and in between there we see what they're doing is they're using money to buy people to come over to their side to get their numbers so things are happening the judiciary is being compromised and we see we see the people that were thrown out because of the corruption now coming back, all right? Because their court cases are now being deferred and uh, some of them are getting off scot-free and ordinary people like us, Christians like us, the people who have fought for the last election are disappointed, very disappointed. While we looked very much to people at the time, to the Pakatan Harapan, even in the two years, they were not able to do much, but they were also beginning to, we were beginning to see also that the same issue of the human heart has not been dealt with. Okay? That's the problem we have today in the challenge that comes. So the question that I want to ask, if we believe that GE14 
was the work of God in response to the prayers of the church in Malaysia. Do you believe that first? I'm not saying you have to. It could be just one of those things. People get so fed up with Najib and his people that they all decide to come together. Or, did, is, or is it really God responding to the prayers of the church? Because there was unprecedented prayer and intercession. Then the question we want to ask is, why then has God allowed the properly elected government to be overthrown by betrayals and subterfuge? What is God doing? If he was involved in overthrowing the old government, why is he allowing it within two and a half years for a backdoor government to come in that restore back almost everything that we've won? Why? And I'm going to talk to you from the Bible concerning God's dealings with nations and with his, with his people. And I hope to give you understanding that that's the direction that the world is heading towards, right? So if G14 was the work of God, then why did God allow it? You know, we've recently, in some of our groups, we've been doing uh, this study on great prayers. And we saw the intercession of the saints. And we saw how the people laid their problems before the Lord. They prayed. And as a result, uh, God worked and acted on their, behavior, on their behalf. Do we believe that God still works on our behalf? And that's the issue. Does God still work with the nations? So, is God concerned for the nation? Now, in Genesis chapter 10, the first 11 chapter of Genesis details the outworking of God before Abraham and the rest of the nations come about. It is the early days of creation. And the Bible says that the clans of the sons of Noah, Noah were the, uh, and, his, uh, and uh, eight of them were the descendants, were the people that started the new generation after the old was destroyed. The clans of the sons of Noah, according to genealogies in the nations, and from these nations spread, at the nations, from these, the nations spread abroad, abroad on the earth after the flood. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the Old Testament, we often see, look at it as if the New Testament is just focused, Old Testament is just focused on Israel. That God is only interested in Israel. The plans of God have to start from a person. You see, when man sinned, and in the first 11 chapter, there was the destruction of the known world at the time, and then there was the beginning of fresh, God began the work of redemption. And to begin the work of redemption, he started with a man called Abraham. He started with one. There was no Jewish nation. There was no Israel. There was only one man, a man who was found faithful, who obeyed God. From that one man came the 12 sons, the 12 tribes. And they were 400 years in Egypt. And when they came out through the deliverance of God by Moses, then the Israel as a nation was formed. And what God was doing was through that one man and through that one nation, demonstrating his heart for all the nations and all the world. So that's God's plan. From the particular to the general. From one man to all men. One nation to all nations. Suggest to you that uh, God has a lot to say about the wider world, for this wider world is part of God's plan to bring about the redemption of His creation. At the end, what do we see in Revelation? Out of every nation, okay, they will be represented in the church, people saved from every nation. But the very interesting thing is that uh, after the Old Testament, in the last book of Malachi, uh, before that, we see God dealing with Israel as a nation, and we see God dealing with the nations surrounding them. And, uh, but after the New Testament, when Jesus Christ came, there's no record about God dealing with nations, as it were. But the focus now became on the church. The plans of God has moved on. And uh, God was calling people out from nations, so the church is not a nation. The church is people called out from every nation. You have the, uh, 
you have the uh, Chinese, the Indians, the Malays. I start with Malaysia. Huh? All right, Chinese, Indian, the Malays. I should start with Malays, Chinese, and Indian. Then you have the Africans. You have the in Indians in India. Everybody is included in that one church. And that's important for us to know. That one church becomes the apple of God's eye. But this one church is made up of people who are still in nations. So we have dual citizenship. Which, guess which one comes first? The kingdom of God. That's why, for those who understand this, they understand the difference between patriotism and nationalism. All right? Patriotism is a good thing. We need to be patriotic to our nation. Nationalism is not a good thing because then we focus on our nation above everybody else. Okay? And so, one of these days, we'll talk about that. But we are citizens of heaven first. Your loyalty is to God first, first and not to your nation. That's what Paul teaches, that's what the Bible teaches. So, does God still deal with nations today? Yes. And I'm going to share with you, and uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, God still deals with nation. But just like in the Old Testament, uh, Judah or Israel was God's people because God was giving knowledge about himself to the rest of the world through Israel. And Israel was meant to be the hope of the world. To take the, to take the knowledge of God and bring it across to every nation. But if you read the Old Testament, you find out that they failed. They failed miserably and God had to judge them. God had to use the nations to judge His own people. Today, Israel is no longer in the special position that God is using though there will be a day of restoration, but today the church, the people of God, is what God is focusing on. And we are in the nation. And just like God uses the nation to deal with Israel, today God uses the nations and the things that happen in the nation to deal with His people, the church. And that's the premise I want to start with before we go to the book of Habakkuk, all right? Habakkuk is an Old Testament book, just three chapters, but very powerful chapter that will give us an understanding of what God does when He deals with nations and what happens to the people of God while God is dealing with nations, all right? But I want you to see this uh, little movie clip on the hope of the world today. Can we play that? Move on to the next slide. All right. I think there's a lot of conflict in the world and I think there's a lot of uncertainty. I think things are messy right now. It's going to be like this for a while. I'm a little concerned with the, the state of security in our nation. You can't walk around and feel as safe as you would have five years ago. There are unethical people out there and, and unethical deals do happen. Too much distrust among people. There's a lot of killing, violence. People just want to kill each other. War is troubling us. The war is awful. The devastation, disease, famine. The environment is really a scary thing. The economy is a mess. Terrorism. World's hunger. Hatred. Crime. I think we're as fractured as we've ever been. There's just been so much thrown at everybody and you don't know what to believe. It's getting worse. I think it is getting worse. It's tough and not good. It's scary. There's a lot of chaos. I've become very disheartened. I don't know if there's any hope. If you just sort of judge by the press and the evening news these days, you know, by all the bad news that's coming our way, it's almost as though we're being told we can expect the darkness of human depravity to just spread further and further around the country and around the world. Commentators aren't coming right out and saying it, but they might as well. That there are no answers and there is no ultimate hope. Fasten your seatbelts, it's only going to get worse. But most of them are totally unaware of what we in this room represent. You see, we are representatives of little redemptive communities from all over the world. 
And we are doing our best to chase back the darkness of depravity with the light of the transforming love of Christ. I listen to lots of my friends now, many of whom are still in government. I feel their sense of despair. I meet thousands of Americans who tell me that they feel demoralized by the decay around us. Where is the hope? But let me tell you, having spent 20 years in government at the highest offices in our land, and 20 years now as a Christian, the hope that each of us has is not in who governs us or what laws are passed or, or what great things we do as a nation. Our hope is in the power of God working through the hearts of people. And that's where our hope is in this country. That's where our hope is in life. And I believe in the potential and the power of the local church more today than I ever have before. And I see the church with greater and greater clarity as the single hope of the world. There is despair, there is fear everywhere. There are no countries today that are above all these things. And that's what the Bible says. The breakdown in society, the breakdown in systems is taking place. COVID-19 was just accelerated the thing. In one day, the economy is gone. And they still haven't recovered. And things are going from bad to worse. Just like Judah, Israel was the hope of the nations and they failed. Today, the church is the hope of the nations. Little redemptive communities like us, winning people, getting them saved, restored to God, and uh, irrespective of what's happening around us, reaching, touching lives. The brokenness of people's lives can be ministered to by the grace of God and by the love of God. And I've heard testimonies after testimonies of people broken in society whom Jesus touched and restored them. We can be conquerors even in the most difficult situation. So I just want to rephrase the question a little bit just now. What is God doing to what is God saying to the church? When the nations was used to deal with Judah, what was God saying to Judah? If today the same thing is happening and we see a little bit of success, that was the same with uh, Israel, do you know? When the good king came, there was a revival. Things became better. The bad king came, things went down again until God said, that's it, I'm going to deal with you, all right? And so we see for a moment, for about two years, we had uh, a little in, a, a glimpse into what things could be in Malaysia if there were a government that uphold justice, separation of powers. We saw, we were so happy at the beginning when the elected, the, uh, the appointed the Attorney General with uh, Tommy Thomas and uh, the election commission with the man called Art Harun and the speaker of the uh, parliament, I forgot his name, but a, a, an ex-judge who was very impartial. We thought, wow, we're seeing, we are seeing the restoration of our institutions. And within two and a half years, Tommy is no longer there and we got a AG that seems like he's going to, you know, whitewash a lot of things, okay? And our speaker, now they're trying to get rid of the speaker and bring another person in and remove the election committee. So what's happening? So good king come, okay. Bad king come, things goes down. What's God saying to the church in the midst of all these things? You and I are the church. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, if you believe in Jesus and you have not been baptized yet, I want to suggest to you, make a public confession. Register. Let's have a, let's have a baptism now that things are okay. All right, let's have a baptism and be proud to declare to the world, I'm a child of God. You're part of a redemptive covenant community that's going to bring hope to the people. Be proud of who you are. In fact, I was just thinking this morning, I said, you know, I don't see many people carrying Bibles nowadays, okay? okay maybe because our handphone has a Bible. But I think that, isn't it wonderful if we 
carry our Bible and go to church. And people will wonder, who are these people carrying this big book? And be proud. Of course, in the past, it was like a badge of honor. You don't really read the Bible. Don't just carry the Bible and don't read it. But since we are a people of the Word, the church, a story, a Bible storing church, we should be proud to be able to hold the Bible and say, I'm a Christian. I'm going to church, you know, and I'm going to show the world I'm a Christian. Let's be proud of our heritage. So what's God saying to the church? I want to take you to the book of Habakkuk and I want to show you what God's saying to us today. You know, Habakkuk is part of that, what we call the minor prophets or the twelve. They're called minor, not because they're not so important as the major ones, but because the book was one chapter, two chapter, short books, okay? And uh, so, but equally important. So Habakkuk is part of that, uh, is in the eighth position of this twelve, and it follows Nahum, and it's before Zephaniah, all right? If you want to locate it towards the end of the Bible, uh, uh, end of the Old Testament, it's between Nahum and it's before Zephaniah. And these three prophets were contemporaries. They were together as they prophesied over Israel, over Judah. And they all shared this common conviction that Yahweh, Jehovah, is sovereign in the affairs of man, never lost control. He's in charge of all the nations, sovereign in the affairs of men, and he would judge the wicked and he would deliver the righteous. So God still deals with nations today. He's sovereign over what's happening in Brazil, in Malaysia, in India. He's sovereign. And if he's sovereign, why is he allowing things like that to happen? Habakkuk prophesied in the first five years of Jehoiakim, who was a bad king, led the people of Judah into many, many uh, problems. And uh, that was almost the end before the enemy would come to take them out. God would judge his own people. And it is the only book in the Old Testament where you see a prophet talking with God and God talks back and he asks a question, God talks back. All the other prophets were just prophesying the word of God. No? And it was directed to a world that through the eyes of God's people seems to be on the edge of disaster. For some of us who have been following our own political situation, and for some of you who are following the political situation in your own country, it looks like they are on the edge of a disaster. And Habakkuk's prophecy was uh, directed to the world then. The northern kingdom, Israel. Okay, i give you a picture for those who are uh, not familiar with Old Testament. They started with a united kingdom. The 12 tribes were united under David and under Solomon. Saul, David, and Solomon, they were united. After Solomon, because of Solomon's uh, adultery, uh, idolatry and all the things, and, and then it was broken up into two. The northern kingdom called Israel, consisting of the 11 tribes, 10 tribe tithing, and the southern kingdom called Judah and Benjamin together. All right? Judah. So, or was it 11 tribes and doesn't matter. Two big groups. Israel's king was the worst. King after king disobeyed God and did the wrong things until the Lord allowed the Assyrians, that time was a world empire, the Assyrians came and they took them away in the year 72 BC. But the God's people were still in Israel, in Judah, the southern kingdom. But now under Jehoiakim, they were coming to the brink of disaster. And things were happening in Judah that faithful people like Habakkuk were wondering what was God doing. You see, Judah had also started to become like a failed state. Right? And so I'm going to take you through this, give you first a structure, and then we'll see. Habakkuk is structured this way. Habakkuk had two complaints. First complaint to God, why? Are you allowing evil to happen in Judah, his own nation? He saw the wickedness of Malaysia. We see the wickedness of Malaysia, the corruption. You see the wickedness in your nation. Why, God, are you letting the nations that we love go down that road? 
The second part to it was God's answer to him. And he didn't like God's answer. Because God's answer was not what he expected. So he had a second question. So let's go into it. Nah? His first complaint. How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. You know, sounds like some of us, Lord, we've been praying, we've been praying. You heard us, you know, two years, two, three years ago, and now we've been praying. And I, almost everybody is like giving up hope. I don't see much interest in prayer. That's why I want to challenge the church. We need to come back to pray. We need to come back and pray. How long must I call for help? But you don't listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry. But you don't come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight, particularly on uh, WhatsApp, on the Facebook. <laughs> you post something, somebody else will argue with you, and it goes on. The people love to argue, all right, and fight. We're surrounded by people who, think, who seem to think they are right, and you have false news and, and uh, true news. So why are you allowing us to watch all this misery? Next thing he says, the law has become paralyzed. There's no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. Wow, isn't that what's happening today in our nation, your nation? You know, the wicked seem to outnumber the righteous. Justice has become perverted. We look with fear and trepidation even as we continue to watch out for the judgment that will come uh, for the SRC case concerning Najib. Is the judge going to acquit him and say, oh, he didn't know anything. It was Jolo and, uh, and he gets scot free. We are worried about what's happening because we see one, we, one corrupt man in Sabah, Musa Ahmad, with 40, or 40 over co uh, corruption charges against him all removed because the attorney general say, I don't find anything I can charge him for. 42 charges, nothing you can charge him for. The hanky-panky is going on. So this is what's happening. So Habakkuk was looking at his, uh, uh, Judah, his state. He says, how can that be? Lord, I cry out to you, but you don't seem to answer. So his question to God was, why does God not punish wicked Judah? Why does God not punish Najib? Why does God not punish the present group of people who are doing all kinds of things that are wrong. Why? God will be crying out to you. You seem to be so silent. Alright? And what was the Lord's answer? Too long for me to type out. Nah? <laughs> uh, so I put down to you Habakkuk 1, 5 to 11. You want to go back and read. Basically it says that Judah will be punished but Habakkuk didn't quite like let me just read to you, all right? Okay. If you've got your Bible, can turn to it. No? 5 to 11. This is the Lord's answer. He says, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. I am raising up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. Huh? I'm raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breath of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. The horses also are swifter than leopards, and they are more fierce than the evening wolves. Their charges charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold. They heap up earthen mounds and seize it. And then he passes as a wind. He commits offense and ascribes his power to his God. Why didn't Habakkuk like God's answer? What the Lord was saying was that I am going to judge. Judah will be punished. But I'm not going to judge in the way that you think it's going to be. I'm going to judge by bringing this wicked nation, this empire of the Chaldeans, 
and they will attack Judah and they will overrun it. Wow, would you like that to happen to your beloved country? <laughs> we cry out, God, why don't you judge the wickedness? And then he says, I'm going to allow a terrible thing to happen to your nation. It's very interesting, yeah? Empire after empire will reach its peak. And then in God's time, because of the things that they've done, and because of their wickedness and their pride, God allows another empire to come and destroy them. So don't ever think that our nation will always stand before God. We need to pray. We need to pray. All right? And this is what Habakkuk's second complaint was all about. After listening to the first answer of God, it will tell us why he was not happy. It's, oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you do not plan to wipe us out? <laughs> so he was saying, Lord, I'm asking you to judge Judah. I'm not asking you to wipe Judah out. <laughs> but the answer of God seems to be that the coldness will come. That's why he is saying, you are eternal. Surely you do not plan to wipe us out. Oh Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But you are pure and you cannot stand the sight of evil. So why do you wink at their treachery? Why are you silent? You be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they. In other words, hey, Lord, if you want to compare, Judah is not as wicked as the Chaldeans. Why you use a more wicked person to judge the less wicked? The difference is because Judah is God's possession. Right? And God must deal with his people. In judgment, God is making changes. And that's an important thing to understand for us as a church. What are you saying to the church? Why are you allowing these things to happen? And I believe God's allowing these things to happen in the nation that the church may repent and come back to becoming the hope of our nation. We have to be the hope of our nation. The nations have no hope outside of the church that will bring the love of God. And if the church is not doing that, God just allow us to go through our problems, our difficulties, until we learn to come back to where He wants us to be. And He says something very interesting here. Habakkuk says, are we only fish? to be caught and killed? Are we only sea creatures that have no leader? Must we be strung up on our hooks, on their hooks, and caught in their nets while they rejoice and celebrate? I can almost see, uh, you know, those, those people there that are today having uh, power, they're laughing, they're celebrating. I see the big crook and the other crook uh, having a meal together, laughing away, and then we're saying, Lord, are we just only fish? <laughs> waiting to be caught and killed. Because when God allows this thing to happen, Habakkuk will say, then they will worship their nets because, they, because their nets were to used to catch people. They will worship their kleptocracy. They will worship their corruption because uh, these are the nets uh, that have made them rich, they will claim. So we're crying out for justice, but God doesn't seem to be giving justice. And Habakkuk says, Will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquest? So this was his second complaint. His first complaint was, God, why don't you judge Judah? Lord, deal with your people so that they become more holy, become more righteous. And then when God gave the solution, uh, his judgment, he says, Lord, how can that be? You use some people more wicked than us to judge us. And how long will we, are we going to be like fish that are going to be caught in their nets? Kind of thing. Will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever? in their heartless conquest. So, the second complaint that can be summarized is this. Why will God use an ungodly nation to punish Judah? So, after that, that's chapter 1. Eh? After that, this, the prophet decides, this is what I'm going to do. I'll climb up to my watchtower and I will stand at my guard post. Then I will see what the Lord has to say and how he will answer my complaint. See, 
he is like uh, this petulant prophet. He said, God, you give me the answer. I don't know. I'm going to stand. I'm going to watch how you're going to answer my second complaint. How are you going to deal with my second? Are you, are you able to see uh, uh, how wicked they are? You're using the wicked to judge those who are more righteous. This doesn't, doesn't seem right. It's not in your ways. I'm going to see what you're going to do. All right? And the Lord's answer to him is the most powerful part, chapter 2, which I want to just very quickly outline to you, and we're going to look at it. Again, it's from, uh, too long for me to type out. <laughs> chapter 2, verse 2 to 20. Oh, a long series of things that, that the Lord said. Yes, an ungodly nation will punish Judah. But the, main, but the thing really was that after that, God will judge that ungodly nation. But when? God doesn't say. So, well, God's going to do it. God's going to deal with the wickedness. But Lord, when? We pray so long, when? And God is silent on the when. But in between these verses, there are three key verses, okay, that we're going to look at. But first of all, let's look at what the Lord said to uh, Habakkuk. That's the only part I type out for you from the long chapter to, uh, 2 to verse 20. The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. God has a plan. To judge his nation with an ungodly nation and what he's saying is that at the end there will come about what god has intended the vision that god has for this world will come to pass in the meanwhile when you write it down those who read it may run okay may know how to take shelter and protect and, and protect yourself okay it will happen, though it tarry, it will come to pass. So when we talk about end times, and we see the things we are going to go through, it will come to an end. When? We don't know. We don't know. So there are the three key verses that I picked up from the rest of it. The first key verse, Behold the proud, his soul, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Do you remember this famous, the just shall live by his faith? That was Martin Luther as a Catholic priest, getting nowhere in his trying to find peace with God, doing all the penance, and nothing was meeting his deep spiritual needs until he came to this verse that says, no matter what situation we're going to do, go through, the just shall live by faith. So what's the first word? You see your nation going down to the docks, if we see Malaysia going down worse into worse state, God's word to the just is that while even these things happen, happens, live by faith. You don't see changes, live by faith. All right? And then he talks about how this nation will come and do what they do. And then later uh, in the chapter 2, the Lord pronounces five woes over the Babylonians, and the five woes are judgment on them that he will do it. When it will end, we don't know. But while God is dealing with them, the nation of Judah was going to go through the captivity. They were going to be, the, the nation, the ungodly nation will judge them. They're going to suffer, but the just shall live by faith. So there will be people who will, every, like people like Daniel and their three friends, young men taken into Babylonian captivity. What did they do? They will not compromise with the ungodly king and the ways. Culturally, they remain as a Jew. They will not eat food offered to idols. And God promoted them. God gave them a spirit that was different than the others. In the ungodly nation, Daniel and his three friends rose up to power that he became an advisor even to the king. In the midst of all these things happening in our nation, I am not promising you that just because we pray, uh, Pakatan Harapan will come back into power, 
Because if we place our hope on man, it's going to be equally disappointing. Because for all you know, after a while, they too will start you know, putting their hands in the till and, and taking out money and getting corrupted. Okay? And then things may get worse. But God, put your faith in God. The just shall live by faith. So what's my challenge to you and I, church, as we go through the events that's happening in our nation is that keep our faith. Believing in God that at the end, everything will come up. And what is the end that the vision that the Lord has? In between this judgment of Babylon, the Lord says this verse, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Second key verse in Habakkuk chapter 2. First one, live by faith. To do what? To know that after everything is over, when God has finished with the judging of this world, the knowledge of God is going to fill the whole earth. The knowledge of the glory of God will fill the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. We don't see that. Very hard to see. Some of the things God says today, we can't see it. We don't see it in our nation as yet. Okay? We don't see it yet. We see a little glimpse, then back again. It may be a little glimpse, then back again. Because that's the way the nations of the world are going to go. All right? Increasingly breakdown of law and order, increasingly breakdown of righteousness. Because this is a wicked world on a collision course with Christ. And we can't change the course of our nations. We can pray that God will do His will, that God will do something, that we become the hope of the nation. What is the key? What is the third key verse there? Towards the end of chapter 2, verse 20, he says, But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth, earth keep silence before Him. What he's saying is that God is sovereign. All the, the people will try to use the idols, their gods, whatever, to try to speak to the situation. But let the people be silent before Him. For God is in His temple. God is at work to purify His temple, to purify His people. So watch the words we say. The just shall live by faith. The whole earth is going to be full of the glory of God. And while God is doing what He's doing, let's keep silent. Let's pray to the Lord. Let's carry on like what Habakkuk was praying on and keep on praying out for our nation. But let's not murmur, complain against the Lord. God is sovereign and God does what He wants to do. So, maybe here is where we just want to uh, summarize by putting the three observations. In times when God is judging our nation, He's actually dealing with the church as well because the hope of the nation is the church. Remember this thing, the just will live by His faith. Number two, the whole earth will one day be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Keep silent, for God is in His holy temple. So this is what we have. Last week was a stone and a, and a sling. This week is a prayer and a song. And that's in chapter 3. Habakkuk, after hearing what God said, he had a prayer to God and he had a song. And that's what we're going to do. And with that prayer and the song, we're going to face the challenge of the giant that's facing us. What is his prayer? Oh Lord, I have heard your speech and I was afraid. What was he afraid? He was afraid both about the enemy that was coming and also afraid of the Lord and God's sovereignty. I have heard your speech and was afraid. Oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. And we need to pray, Lord, revive your church. God's dealing with the church. Revive your church. People have lost passion for God nowadays. We're no longer concerned about ourselves about the things of God. We are more or less like, okay, we go to church, we, we do this, we do that, we pay our tithes, and, uh, and, and that's it. There's no longer the passion. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is. Let me serve you, let me love you, let me share uh, your goodness to people around me. Revive. So, 
Habakkuk's prayer. I want to challenge this church. Join us at prayer meeting. Ask God to revive us. Revive your work in the midst of the years. Midst of what years? The years of those judgment. The years when Babylon was attacking Judah and, and, and Habakkuk was saying, revive your work. Keep the holy people. Keep the people. You know, they were contemporaries. Jeremiah was prophesying around the time. Ezekiel, they were all prophets. And these were people who know the Lord. Daniel and his three friends. And all this, revive your work. In wrath, remember mercy. When God is judging, let's cry out to him, Lord, remember mercy. Remember us. Remember mercy. Give us mercy. We are frail creatures. You just have to be angry with us and we are gone. Lord, remember mercy. Cry out to God. Remember mercy for our nation, for our people, people, innocent people. You know, if Malaysia becomes a failed state, who's going to suffer? A lot. Some of us have got our earnings saved up. Eh? You can survive, all right? You have enough money to live until you go home to the Lord. But there are many people who live from hand to mouth. And the majority of them are going to be the people who are the Malays themselves. And the own government don't care about it. As long as I become rich, you can die. And that's what's going to happen. The failed state means that, do you know, even today, there are people who are struggling to make it in life just for the next meal. And you and I have got be, to be the hope of this nation. We have to lose our fear of governments and we have to go out and do the things that are important. All right? Okay, go back and read this chapter 3. There's one part he described about God coming in his power and all these things, but, he didn't, but God didn't say when. Eh? He see God coming from Teman, from uh, Paran, and with, uh, the, the, with the, uh, on the clouds, on, with his chariots and everything, bringing judgment to the Babylonians, you know, but he doesn't know when. And this is the song he sings that we want to just close with. In the midst of those years when things are not good, Habakkuk says, Now, Lord, I understand. I will not complain. I will be silent in before you. And I will sing, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in my God, in the Lord. I will rejoice in I will joy in God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. We can face this giant with a prayer, revive your work, and with a song of praise, a hymn of faith, even though everything around us is not blossoming and we have to go through it, the just shall live by faith. That's why this became a song. A song that overcomes. Now, I found one very old song by Don Moen. And I want you to listen to it, sing along with it. In fact, when he sang this, it was in the context of this hymn about the fig tree not blossoming. Okay? So, can I have the lights off while we watch this next and we finish with this song? You seem so far away, a million miles or more, it feels today. And though I haven't lost my faith, I must confess right now that it's hard for me to pray.
hard for me to see all the thoughts and plans you have for me. Yes, it is. But I will put my trust in you. Lord, we pray to you, Lord. Often we don't understand your plans and your, your purposes. While we know what you have said in your word, but Lord, in our hearts, often we want to cry out to you, Lord. When, Lord? When will you, when will you change things around? Father, this morning, help us understand that, Lord, the just shall live by his faith. And that one day, this whole earth is going to be full of the glory of God. That while... It is still in times of your judgment and of your dealing with this world. We will be silent because you are in your holy temple, Lord. So we thank you, Lord. This morning, I pray for your people. I pray that decisions will be made today. Lord, for those who feel God speaking to them, I pray that even though we cannot have altar calls because of the SOPs, I pray that, Lord, they will respond and they will uh, WhatsApp me and talk to me about what they plan to do, what they want to do. If they want to accept the Lord, uh, talk to me about it and put your life behind uh, the purposes of God. Uh, I pray the people of God here are going to be blessed today and the week ahead of us, that as we come again next week, it's going to be with the joy of the Lord uh, as a victorious people. So receive the blessing of the Lord and the light, let the light of His countenance be upon you. Let His face shine upon us. Let the Lord bless us and keep us. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord.